Okay, uh, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, thanks for your presence. So, uh, to kick off the journey, uh, so as per the overall agenda, we do have uh, two exercises today. Uh, one is around the kiosk engineering uh, that we will kick off. So, this will be roughly uh, more than a two hours of exercise uh, that we will uh, cover. So, as per the basic agenda, uh, we will start with uh, uh, the basic introduction son of uh, kiosk engineering what exactly is kiosk engineering and briefing up around that and we will actually cover hands on exercises uh, that how exactly uh, kiosk uh, attacks we can plan out how exactly we can integrate the overall kiosk engineering in our day to day life in our projects what is the need for that why exactly that will be needed so we will cover up all those details so uh, at the moment, like even uh, Swati mentioned, uh, so all the participants, they are being muted. So uh, you guys will be given a sufficient time uh, for the Q and A's. Uh, till then, if you have any queries around any of the discussions around any of the concepts, please uh, put your questions in the Q and A section and uh, we will try to give the answers to the level best that we can do at the moment. Okay, so considering that, uh, let's start our journey. Uh, let's understand uh, uh, from the kiosk engineering perspective. So uh, before we jump, so I'm extremely sorry here. So uh, hello everyone. I'm Ravinder, Ravinder Singh. Uh, I'm working as a lead QA with ThoughtWorks and. Uh, currently working with a financial client out there. Uh, with me, uh, Swati, Vinay and Asis will be pairing and uh, we will be explaining you guys the concepts of kiosk engineering and how exactly we can do the hands-on implementation uh, for the kiosk attacks out there. Okay, uh, to start with, uh, so what exactly has changed uh, in the software development uh, overall? So if I look back in my experience in the industry more than a decade back when I started, uh, so majorly the softwares that were there into the market, they were monolithic, right? So there used to be a three tire application, which has a UI, one backend API that has the business logic. And finally the data layer out there that gives you the storage of data or any needed information that you used to store. Even though monolithic, we are not saying uh, that they are out of the market. So depending on the need, they still exist, but surely market has improved a lot. And uh, the overall software development architectures, they have changed from monolithic to distributed. So we all understand that, that microservices has come in place, micro frontends has come into place. We can have distributed databases in place. Yeah, and even with the introduction of uh, clouds like AWS, Google Cloud, Azure uh, in place, uh, we know that we can have independent services in place, right? And each service can be developed and deployed independently. Each service can have their own business logic. And even with these micro frontends and microservices in place, we know that even the programming language dependency is not there. One service can be in one programming language and the other one can be in the other programming languages, right? So it's kind of a complete flip what used to happen uh, a decade uh, back and how exactly the software development practices are going on in place at the moment. So before we move and understand that what exactly has impacted the overall things, uh, let's look back at an example. So that happened with Netflix, right? We all know Netflix. Uh, we all know that Netflix even is using uh, these uh, architecture of uh, microservices paid, but still uh, on a Christmas Eve in 2012, uh, there was one incident that was being reported that Netflix has the complete system deployed on AWS. Okay, even they were having load balancer where the load was divided into 50-50% that depending on the, the geography, how exactly the load is coming, it was evenly being distributed, but still, their services were down for more than a couple of hours on a Christmas Eve in 2012. What was the reason? How exactly does it happen? And with a, as large a play in the market as Netflix. So and this even happened when Netflix was actually practicing the complete distributed system practices in place. 
so when they actually debugged it further the root cause was that all their services they were deployed in one region i think generally uh, whoever we understand that uh, in aws or in any of the clouds we do have uh, the concept of regions right and uh, so like they have a region in singapore they have a region in us so depending on uh, the deployment strategy netflix deployed everything in a single region and that cl complete cluster itself was down so even though they were having load balancing strategies even though they were having the distribution strategies even though the application was fully functional up and running still their services were down for a couple of hours so when they actually debug it further they find out that even though the load balancer was trying to attach their nodes at run time but as the complete us region us east region was down even the load balancer will not find their corresponding machines right even the load balancer will not able to find their corresponding instances where it will attach so that was a learning for netflix that even after distributed system even after following the cloud practices even after following the overall load balancing practices your system can still go down there can be some different perspective that need to be thought through that how exactly we can ensure the availability of system so this was a great example uh, where even uh, the practices of availability of system was being taken into place but something out of the boom happened and uh, the complete cluster went down and we were not the netflix was not able to identify the region of that and it took them more than 2 hours to actually restore this particular stuff so understanding this example i think uh, we all understand that there can be chances of going your system down no matter whatever you have done so generally as a qa what we do to get the confidence of our system right we do kind of all kind of testing we do manual automation uh, considering the overall functional part then we do the performance security considering the overall uh, non functional part even our developers they do uh, the white box unit testing and all those we, we, we try to put as much efforts as we can right we certify our system functionally complete out there but can we assure that even after doing all these things we do assure that my application will be always running when it is deployed in production can we guarantee that right no right because we have seen multiple instances multiple e-commerce site multiple uh, uh, instances we will cover the examples uh, going further so even after doing that much rigorous functional and non functional aspects of the application we cannot assure that the system will not go down into production because the example that we just took for netflix right there was no issue of functional uh, there was no issue of non functional or load right still the system went down because the complete cluster of aws went down so what more what exactly is needed how we as a team members can ensure that my system my application will be always up and running and it will give me a better customer experience out there so that's where actually your resilient systems come into place right let's before moving further let's understand what exactly is a resilient system so when we say resilient system what exactly is so a system which is highly available and durable so the first concept that is needed to ensure that a system is resilient is its availability and durability obviously then the next point is that whether it can maintain an acceptable level of service and by acceptable level of service we mean that there will be certain sls that we claim that my application will be always available that much percentage of time right and can there be chances of recovery if something fails right if due to some infrastructure issues uh, my application goes down can it actually recover from those particular failures and the final one is that if there are some misconfigurations there is something that happens that during deployment or something else they the due to the microservices in picture everything is configuration driven right so can there be chances that if some misconfiguration has happened my system can still recover so if there is a system that actually suffices all these things that it is highly available it meets my acceptable level of uh, service 
and it can actually handle uh, the misconfiguration out there, then we will call it as resilient system. Now, before we move further, generally people use these two terms, uh, resilience and reliability, right? So let's try to understand the difference between these two. So they are related, but they have a minor difference out there. And by minor difference, we uh, mentioned, so like we just discussed resilience, right? Resiliency is that how reliable my system is. And I'm explicitly using the term reliable, right? And here we are saying that resiliency is basically that if there are any failures, if there are any misconfiguration, or if there's something bad that has happened with my system, can my system recover with that? So that's the capability of the system. Resiliency is the capability of the system. But when we say reliability, reliability is that whenever I need my system up and running, whether it is available or not. So reliability is more around from a user perspective and resiliency is more from application perspective. So whenever I need my system, if that is available from an end user perspective, that means my system is reliable. And when the system will be reliable, when it is actually resilience. Hope this makes it clear, uh, the terminology is out there. So considering we understood, okay, what exactly is resilient system, uh, how exactly it will fit, what are the criteria for those, why there is need for resilient system, right? One example we obviously saw uh, for Netflix. I think 90% of us who are in the industry for more than two, three years, we would have been gone through this situation, right? That your application, it was working fine on your dev QA or pre prod environment, but still boom, right? Prod goes down or application is not working on prod. It's not accessible. People cannot access it, right? There can be multiple scenarios. Functionally, it is working fine, but consider the network is not working, right? Consider the application accessibility is not there. The Netflix example that we took, right? The overall cluster itself was not accessible. I think all of us would have seen such kind of situation, right? And this is what actually kicks off that you need your resilient systems. You need to ensure the resiliency of the systems in place. Let's take a couple of examples uh, and I will uh, try to cover up into multiple industries. Let's start with the medical industry out there, right? So we would have seen, in, uh, there was a research some time back that for monitoring specifically uh, around uh, the people who are having heart diseases. So multiple companies are doing research and even there were a couple of applications that are in place that keeps your body monitoring, that keeps your heartbeats monitoring. Now consider your application was working functionally perfectly fine, but due to a network leak, or maybe if it is working on a Bluetooth based, the Bluetooth functionality of your device itself is not working, right? Or your application is not accessible. What will be the impact of that, right? It can actually lead to death of that particular person who is under monitoring. Even we see such monitoring systems installed in the hospitals, right? So there, if there is some malfunction in any of the device, that can be due to the infrastructure issue. Consider the impact of that, right? So these kind of softwares that we generally call as a grade softwares because they direct have impact on the human life. Let's take another example, airways, right? Uh, they, there was one example sometime back for British Airways uh, that uh, their communication with the ATC was not working. That was one stuff. So there they were actually having a solution that the manual pilot took over and actually handled it. But there was one more instance in 2018 with British Airways that even though if we see it was just that uh, uh, their ticketing system was not working. It's just a basic example, right? So they were not able to do automatic check-ins. And just because automatic check-ins were not working, the industry was impacted by 8 million because the number of rows of people keep increasing because they were doing manual check-ins. And the traffic on Heathrow Airport was that much that they were not able to handle that particular stuff continuously for more than a day. Even they have to cancel multiple flights because the check-ins were not able to handle. So just because a simple system on the devices was not working where they can do automatic check-ins, it costed the airlines more than 8 million. 
education industry, one of the good examples these days, right? We considering COVID in place, uh, we can understand that uh, specifically people with kids, right? All of them are getting online classes. E even prior to that, all uh, as a practitioner, even we used to learn multiple things online. The industry is too huge these days. It's a billion worth industry that is running out there. And purely it's dependent on internet, communication, right? Your application is working fine, everything is working fine, but the communication to the server is not working. Think of an impact, right? If at a particular day, schools, colleges are not able to deliver their classes, the overall impact is millions of worth. And consider the other way also, the knowledge of the students. So considering this, I'm just trying to show that even though we put that much effort into the functionality, there can be certain unseen uh, stuff into your industries. There can be certain unseen factors into your uh, overall environment that can lead to failure of your application. I think we all know this is uh, one famous image uh, about the fires into uh, the Australian forest. Uh, so all of the monitoring they were doing uh, using some uh, systems that due to which they were able to save million of tangles out there. If consider if those systems would not have been working, the fire was actually more than uh, I would say 15 or 20 days that it keep running out there and they were able to save more than 1000 tangles because their systems were working out perfectly. But if considered due to these unseen features, their applications were not able to communicate properly that would have impacted the life of countries out there. One more example, I will uh, quickly uh, cover around the financial tech industry. So this was one example of uh, Bank of England where the payment system was not working just for two hours and within two hours, even not the complete payment system, it was an example of that the payment system just for the home buyers. So Bank of England generally works as an intermediary bank where if people have to do some transactions for buying home, uh, they go as an intermediary bank through the Bank of England. And that was one example that the transactions were not happening just for two hours and the Bank of England actually spent more than 50 millions, more than 50 millions just because those transactions were not happening in those two hours because people were not able to buy any homes in that particular uh, time. Gap. So considering all these examples, we can see that all of these systems were tested fully. All of these systems were running as per the expectations. Some systems failed, some systems sustained. But the impact of these systems could have been much, much, much either in terms of financial or either in terms of lives of the humans or uh, other needs out there, right? So what was common in these systems? What exactly, if we see, the primary concern in all these cases was resiliency of the systems availability of the systems, accessibility of the systems, right? So the primary need in these systems that the system should be resilient enough so that they can sustain in those conditions or those extreme conditions that even though we as a QA certified those, but in what conditions they are being deployed, if they can sustain there, then only their actual value comes into picture. So we can see the impact into various industries that how exactly resiliency is playing a role and how exactly it can impact the overall deliverables of the system. So no matter how well you tested it, if a certain application, I will, I will take a simple example, if a simple application you installed on a mobile device and that crashes 10 times a day, it can be due to the memory issue of that particular device, but your application will automatically lose the customer interest out there. Right? They will not think about that it is due to the memory issue of that particular uh, uh, device. They will say that the application is not able to sustain. So how do we build resilient system? Let's see how exactly we can build and how exactly we can ensure that the systems are resilient. That's where actually chaos engineering comes into picture. So this was a term that was being uh, launched by Netflix. And what it says is, Kiosk engineering is just a discipline of experimenting on the software system in production. Why explicitly in production? So, because uh, like we mentioned as per the example, there can be chances that uh, whatever was working on a pre-prod environment, it can actually fail on a prod environment. So generally organizations who implement Kiosk engineering, uh, they keep running their experiments on prod. So we can develop our overall uh, uh, I would say hypothesis or overall uh, 
schemas that we will do on to your pre prod environment but the final runs will be done on the prod environments out there so why kiosk engineering what is the need for this one i think we understand all by all these examples that bad things will always happen the example that we took from netflix even though they were practicing kiosk engineering they started practicing kiosk engineering in back in 2007 and still their system failed in 2012 so they are bound to that with time there can be certain conditions that it can lead to a failure out there so considering those systems we need to actually implement the kiosk engineering principles let's quickly understand what kiosk engineering is so it is a thoughtful controlled and planned experiment we are explicitly saying thoughtful and controlled because you need to understand your system well it cannot that okay you go and just run some experiment made your system down and it should be a planned experiment by planned we means that you know okay what you are going to do how exactly it will impact your application you need to understand that what will be the replications on the business or on the engineers if there is certain failure happen that that is something that need to be understood out there obviously uh, considering working into the service industries or considering uh, everyone the software are consumed by consumers there should be a sls so obviously if my overall availability of the system increases it will improve the sls and finally it will fortify systems by building and moving fast by building the confidence in the systems by revealing the weak points of the system and assuring that you can still serve your customers if there is some mishap happens so like netflix example we took i will again reiterate that so if they would have been working into multiple zones if one zone gone down they would have still service their customers from the other zone so that's more around understanding your application and planning it better that's how kiosk helps in identify let's quickly understand what kiosk engineering is not it's not obviously making your application down right so it should not be random unsupervised or unmonitored and by random means okay suppose you are having 10 microservices and you just go and make any service down no right because first you need to understand the impact of that so you can generate some random load you can generate some random conditions but the experiment should not be random out there right you should be aware of okay whatever you are do, going to do on your application what can be the replication for that obviously it should be monitored if you are not monitoring your application you cannot understand what will be the impact of the experiment that you will do obviously not breaking down the production by accident uh, generally uh, we as a qa generally when we do non functional specifically the performance one we try to put that much load okay let's take the breakage point okay but that's not what kiosk engineering is with because we are doing these experiments on production right so our intent is not to break your production system that's why we are explicitly saying we should understand okay how your system is working what are its intricacies if you actually put something on to one part of your system what will be its impact on to the overall system and whether your system can recover or not so those intricacies you should be aware about your system i think already covered we are not planning to run our experiments to create outages so if you are saying we are not doing all these things why would we try to break our systems why would we make uh, certain services down i think we can relate to this particular stuff right we get our kids vaccinated we know that it will create pain but we know that it is for their better man. and we know that it is done in a controlled manner we know okay what will be its impact on the side effects out there so if we understand all those perspectives what kiosk engineering will do it will identify the weaknesses of your system will bring that picture of your system using which you can improve your system and make it more resilient so that's it that's what we understood we understood okay what is kiosk how exactly a uh, kiosk can help us what is the need out there so before moving to the next step before moving how exactly we can implement the kiosk experiments how exactly we can use our tools on to various application any questions any queries that are there so we are going to take a 5 minutes break here uh, we will just understand the uh, system so any queries up to here uh, till we cover the next step no nope. okay so uh, quickly i will uh, cover a few more points out here uh, so just give me more 
so these are few of the historical stuffs that happened in kiosk engineering uh, so just briefing out so that we understand that uh, how kiosk start and what is exactly is the current state so kiosk started in 2008 out there uh, it was netflix who launched this term uh, then in 2010 they actually created a couple of tools called kiosk monkey and cnn army that they were experimenting then in 2012 uh, the issue happened with uh, netflix that we mentioned out there and uh, actually they increase their frequency of kiosk attacks onto the production at that particular moment then few of the uh, people from netflix itself so they were actually planning to go more deep dive into the system and they created uh, uh, a separate organization called gramdeal and in 2016 they actually uh, launched this product called uh, gramdeal that's a paid tool so we will do uh, and uh, demo some of uh, our attacks using gramdeal to do then in 2017 uh, the kiosk form came into picture 2018 uh, there is a book uh, that came that's called kiosk monkey for spring boot uh, considering uh, the architecture of service mesh that has come into picture in 2019 there are a couple of tools that are being launched that are explicitly for the service based service mesh based applications and finally in 2020 there is a book that has been uh, launched by orly around the kiosk engineering uh, this is really a good book uh, that explains uh, various concepts and uh, the principles of kiosk engineering uh, we can read out those stuff these are few of the companies or the organizations who are uh, using uh, kiosk principles kiosk engineering uh, uh, attacks on a very large scale they use it on a regular basis maximum of them have the microservices based architecture uh, and they do the runs almost on a regular basis so it's kind of their regular practice that the attacks are come, uh, continuously running and their services can that automatically few of the tools uh, i will quickly cover like i mentioned kiosk monkey uh, kiosk monkey uh, was being uh, launched by netflix out there so it needs significant setup uh, majorly it uses a tool called spinnaker uh, that is used for making your all our uh, systems down uh it's a open source tool at the moment but overall setup and all those details they are really cumbersome at the moment then there is gremlin uh it's a saas based paid tool uh, it gives a uh, really really good uh, i would say ui using which you can plan out your stuff it works for all kind of applications out there uh, that can be implemented uh then there is kiosk toolkit uh, that also we will cover today in our demos uh, it's a open source and majorly cli based tools uh, that also can be run uh, against all kind of applications uh, like uh, docker kubernetes any uh, cloud based applications and finally there is uh, cube invaders it's majorly used for kubernetes based applications so i think uh, in our childhood we used to play a, a game where we used to kill uh, Uh, some stuff onto the screen right so the developer is even same for this particular tool and this is kind of a uh, game playing on a dos so uh, it's a cli based tools uh, but uh, its only limitation is that it's majorly used uh, for the kubernetes based application so for our demo uh, we will cover kiosk toolkit and gremlin today uh, and uh, my colleagues will show all those hands on demo there uh, quickly a uh, few of the benefits of doing kiosk engineering uh, let's understand the benefits from uh, the stakeholders perspective right uh, consider customers right obviously for the end users if my system is reliable if my system is available or it seems available can durability there will be no outages what else a customer can ask for it will makes my application reliable right then if you think from a business perspective if we see there will not be any severe incidents the system will not be less obviously my revenue will increase people have more confidence into my system people will have more confidence into my application and obviously it will reduce the overall maintenance cost and make the corresponding business people happier and finally who are the actual de uh, developers who are the technical people who are supporting your application so if there are no severe instances obviously it will make them also happy because it will be less work on their side their application will be more resilient their application will be more available and the overall on call burden overall uh, i would say failures into the system will reduce so if my application is reliable if my application is resilient it's a win win situation for all customers business and the technical side so uh, uh, the stuff that's it about all the concepts uh, we uh, covered i think all the details out there we understand how exactly we can implement kiosk what is the need how exactly the system can actually handle 
so here we are stopping for five minutes uh, let, let's take a break out there then we will go into the hands-on exercises uh, where we will uh, show you that if you have to implement kiosk engineering in your application how exactly you can plan how the planning goes uh, how exactly you can plan your experiments how exactly you can execute it how monitorings will be set up how monitoring will benefit out there so we will uh, take examples of two tools uh, the kiosk toolkit and the grandit we are explicitly taking two tools here. Uh, Chaos Toolkit, it's an open source CLI based tool. Uh, Gremlin, it's a paid tool. It provides multiple features into its paid version. Uh, but there are a few uh, free functionalities also it provides. So we will cover majorly the free functionality. And we will just try to compare the two tools. Then on the need basis of your application, on the need basis of your infrastructure, you can pick up any of the tools that are available out in the market. But the principles will be same, the implementations will be same. It's more around how exactly you can understand your application and how exactly you can implement the kiosk principles for ensuring that at the end of the day you have a resilient system. So, guys, any queries, any questions, please uh, ping on the QA uh, section and uh, we will try to revert back. So it's 3.45 at the moment. Uh, we will resume uh, in 10 minutes in the next section. Uh, let's take a quick break and anyone who are having queries, please put your queries into the QA section. Also, if there are no questions, then uh, maybe we can just take a two minutes break and then continue. Uh, okay, uh, so there's one question from Arnav. Uh, he's asking that are these tools used for Chaos Engineering free to use? Uh, so uh, Arnav, uh, Chaos Toolkit is an open source CLI based tool. Uh, it is uh, licensed by Apache and it is free to use along with the, uh, so it has a wide community support uh, where there are many plugins available which can be integrated with Chaos Toolkit and it can help you test your live systems available for different infrastructures. So that's a brief about Chaos Toolkit. And Gremlin is a software-based tool uh, which has a dashboard where you can set up different infrastructures integration and uh, do uh, the Chaos attacks accordingly. But yeah, so Gremlin full version is paid one and Chaos Toolkit is an open source. So guys, as per tools, it can be your call and depending on the organization, how exactly it supports and what is the ease you need. But there are multiple tools. There are multiple tools into the market that you can use and depending on how exactly your application is structured, whether it's a microservices based, whether it's cloud based, how exactly it is, again, it will depend on the deployments also whether it's just plain EC2 containers that has been deployed or you are using Kubernetes for implementation of those. So th that will be a call uh, that you as a QA can better understand your system. You can take up those calls as per your applications. That, that's why we have explicitly taken two tools for the demo so that we can just do a relative demo and we can just show okay, kind of similar things we can implement using multiple tools out there. Any other queries, guys, please ask.
Okay, uh, considering the interest of time, uh, let's start. Uh, let's see how exactly we can plan out. Uh, so suppose uh, you have an application, right? And you have to actually evaluate it, whether it is actually ready for your chaos engineering principles, whether you can actually uh, do it or not. So the first foremost condition is you can check whether your microservices are prepared for real world events or not. So if your application is actually end user facing, if it is uh, the people from outside world, it is not just uh, that you're going to use within your organization because when applications are working just within the organization, we know the targeted audience. But when you are going to use it outside your organization, there are people outside and users. So you don't know the actual user base of such kind of applications. You don't know the actual load. You can give rough estimates, but you don't know how exactly the conditions will happen. So that is your first precondition, right? So whether your application is ready for real world application. And is ready means you have functionally, non-functionally validated it. It's feature ready, and you can actually now try your kiosk engineering experiments on those. The second state after that will be to evaluate that do you monitor steady state from your entire system? So whether do you have the monitoring in place? Do you know, okay, if something happens with your system, there are some monitoring or alerting systems in place that can actually give you those alerts. So if you are confident about such kind of monitoring systems, yes, let's go ahead. And finally, you have the confidence in your application that if something bad happened with any of your service, your system can recover for that. So at least you have something in place that can ensure that your system can recover back. So if you have the answer yes to all of these questions, your applications are ready for starting your QoS engineering experiments. You can start your kickoff. So how exactly you can do? So there is a the term called as game days. Game days is more around uh, uh, playing with your system. So how exactly you can uh, plan your systems, how exactly you can plan your QoS engineering experiments out there. So generally, like any other kind of implementation development or testing, you will plan your experiment. And by planning means we will understand our application. We will understand, okay, what we are going to implement out there. Then you will execute the experiment. Obviously, whatever you have planned using certain tools that you have identified, uh, you will execute your experiment. And the final stuff will be that based on these experiments, you will evaluate that whether your next experiment you will scale the overall area or you will squash the overall area. And by area here, we mean the overall implementation, the overall stuff. So suppose uh, in the planning, we identify the hypothesis. By hypothesis, we mean, okay, if I'm going, if I'm saying, okay, if I do certain action A on my uh, application, I know that it should result this. So suppose if I say, okay, if I remove a network from my application, still it will be available in the offline mode. That can be one hypothesis, you know, right? So for such kind of stuff, you will first create the hypothesis, then you will run the experiment. So first you will start with a very minimal blast radius. And by blast radius here, we mean, okay, what is the impact area? Obviously you will not make your complete system down in the start itself. So you will start with a small area, maybe just one microservice in place. And considering those, if your experiment is success, you will scale and repeat. By scale means you will actually go to the larger part of your system. So suppose earlier you were doing the experiment on one part of the microservice, you can actually enhance and take it for the next part. And if you're doing it for one microservice, you can take it to the integration of other microservices. But if it was a failure, by failure means your system was not able to recover, your application was not able to recover. So you will minimize the radius. Means you will first identify that part of your application, that part of your system that can actually recover from those unknown conditions, from those unknown situations. And this way, it will be a repeated experiment. If it will be a success, you will increase the blast radius. If it will be a failure, you will minimize the blast, blast radius out there. So after uh, overall this particular stuff, uh, the next particular thing is understanding the application architecture. So for our application that we will use in our demo, we are using a Kubernetes based application. So I will quickly brief that how exactly a Kubernetes based application they are structured. 
So when you start with in Kubernetes, you will have a top level cluster that's generally known as a K8 cluster. In a cluster, you will have namespaces. So uh, inside a cluster, even whatever application we will use for us, uh, that will have a cluster, then that will have a namespace. Then in the namespace, you will have nodes. So nodes are kind of your machine. So you will have certain machines. And Kubernetes works on the master slave based architecture. So you will have one master node and certain slave nodes out there. Then in the nodes, you will have ports. Uh, ports are kind of your virtual machines that are running out there. And then in the ports, uh, you will have your actual applications running. So whatever your services will be there, so ports can be either ports for the services or there can be storage ports. There are multiple types of ports that uh, K8 provides, uh, Kubernetes provides. Apart from these contents, you can have uh, the service mesh uh, Istio application. So it's kind of a, side bus concept so uh, for the communication of your services uh, people generally use the concept of side bus so even that can be implemented as a container out there and finally you will have uh, some kind of uh, communication or load balancer uh, in place that can will actually uh, ensure that you have a better communication out there and how exactly you can do the load balancing stuff out there so this is general architecture, how a K8 based application looks. You can have different types of ports, you can have different types of uh, nodes, or even you can have different types of applications that can be deployed out there. So even our application that we are going to use for our demo uh, fits in kind of uh, same architecture. So uh, we do have a microservices based application that we will use for demo, uh, which has uh, one port as a TWFlix uh, UI, a uh, couple of microservices running and a couple of databases running out there. So again, it's a three-tier application, but it's a microservice-based application that we will use into our demos, both using Gremlin and the Kios Toolkit out there. So that's about that how exactly a Kubernetes-based application looks like and uh, what application we are going to use for our experiments today. Let's quickly understand that when you plan your attacks, how exactly you can plan it, what will be the strategy? So generally, whenever we do any strategy, we whiteboard certain things, we understand our application, we take a top-down approach that how exactly you can do. Same is the case with when you plan your strategies for kiosk based experiments. So you identify certain factors. So this is kind of a quadrant that is generally used that you divide all your experiments into these kind of uh, four portions where you will have more nodes, Non unknowns, unknown unknowns, and unknown knowns. Uh, what we mean by this is that whatever experiment you will plan, what will be the impact of that? So, suppose if we are saying, okay, if I make my application uh, one container down, what will be the impact of that? Whether I know the impact of that or not. If I know the input, if I know the output, that means it will go into the non knowns. So considering those, uh, first you list down what can be the different kind of experiments that we can do. And then on basis of those experiments, you can identify, okay, where exactly they will fit as per these quadrants. And then you can start with the known knowns out there because you know, okay, if you are going to perform a certain action uh, by this particular experiment, what will be the output of those? So how exactly we can uh, divide uh, the overall experiments out there? So generally uh, we divide into three uh, stuff. Uh, obviously the state of your application. So you can do the attacks such like uh, kill your microservices. Uh, uh, you can actually terminate the ports. You can delete the nodes out there. So it's more around changing the state of your application out there, right? So that can go down. Second one can be around network. There can be network failures. There can be some DDoS attacks. There can be uh, some packet losses out there that can actually impact your application, right? And finally can be resources that due to lack of CPU, due to lack of memory, or maybe some overload out there, your application was not behaving. So generally these three kinds of categories, uh, you can divide your overall attacks out there. And then out of these attacks, you can put uh, your stuff, okay, what you know. Like for our example, we are taking that in network failure, if we add a abort uh, to a certain network, how exactly it will behave, I know okay, my application will not be accessible. If I terminate the pod, uh, we expect that certain application should be up and running, so my pod should automatically come. If we uh, consume the complete CPU of my application, still my application should be accessible. So these are a few of the known areas that we have identified that we will demo on our applications. And other attacks also we identified into the certain criteria. But for today's demo, uh, we will take up uh, the non known part only. So we will cover these three kinds of attacks, network state and resources on our applications out there. 
that's it. Uh, so we understood uh, Kubernetes. We understood uh, the application that we are going to use. We understood that it's a microservice-based architecture. Uh, these are the Git repositories uh, where we have put on all our research and uh, stuff out there and uh, the experiments that Ashish and Swati are going to demo. So now we will actually start with the hands-on exercise out there where uh, Swati and Ashish will use the application that I briefed. They will use Gremlin and Chaos Toolkit to actually do some experiments onto the applications on state, network, and uh, uh, sorry, uh, the state network and the execution out there. So over to you, Ashish and Swati. Thank you, Ravinder. Uh, so hello, everyone. As Ravinder mentioned, uh, we are going to now start with the, start with demonstrating the Chaos attacks, and we have two different tools that we are demonstrating, which is gremlin and chaos toolkit before we start with this i want to call out that we are not inclining towards any particular tool it's just a concept that we are demonstrating using these two tools but you can explore other tools and use them as well so um, here you can see that there are two github, GitHub repositories that we are using so there's the first one which is a chaos guide and then the second one is basically the application that we are setting up to run the attacks on uh, so uh, in the chaos guide, when you open this, we'll be sharing these links with you in the chat. Um, maybe Ashish or Ravinder can share these links with you. And uh, when you open this chaos guide, you will see an SRC folder. When you go to that SRC folder, you would, you would find three subfolders inside of it, which is chaos, chaos toolkit, gremlin and thoughtflix demo. So inside chaos toolkit, you will find out the steps of setting up this tool. Uh, then how do you do these attacks and how do you view the reports? Likewise in gremlin also, you will find uh, the similar kind of steps, but this is for Gremlin. So the prerequisites that you need, uh, the setup, how will you do the setup, the attacks and the reports again. And then the third uh, folder talks about how do you set up this application, which is a ThoughtFlix demo. And uh, uh, so it consists of uh, attacking the application using Gremlin as well as Kiosk, uh, Kiosk Toolkit and then viewing the reports as well. So this is what we are going to cover today. And please, uh, while we are demonstrating, please feel free to drop in your questions in the Q&A and we'll, we'll keep on answering those questions. All right. So uh, now we are going to start with the first uh, tool, which is Gremlin. Let me just uh, present my screen. Yeah. So Gremlin. Uh, Gremlin. What do we mean by Gremlin? So Gremlin is an English word and it means a situation that leads to any unidentified problems or faults. So that's the word. That's where the uh, that's where, where from the word comes from. And uh, what do we do in Gremlin? Is we using the Gremlin? We trigger the attack onto our target. This target can be uh, it can be your cloud instances like AWS, Azure, Google Cloud. It can also be your uh, messaging systems, uh, and it can also be your Kubernetes application. So in our case, we are going to target a Kubernetes application, which Ravinder just talked about. It's we are calling it as ThoughtFlex demo application. And when, when, uh, when we attack our targets, we then uh, view the reports in the form of uh, graphs. And uh, uh, these, these in Gremlin internally uses Prometheus and Gra Grafana to show us these reports. Uh, and it also, uh, it, it also tries to hit the APIs using Postman and gives us a result in the form of logs using Postman. So that is Gremlin. And why, why exactly are we, why are we using Gremlin? So what are the benefits of uh, this tool? So let us see that. Um, just a moment. I'll switch my screen. Yes. Sorry about the delay. Um, yeah. So, uh, Gremlin. So uh, how does Gremlin looks like and how do you set it up? So when you, uh, when you open your browser and you just type in uh, gremlin.com, so uh, you should be able to see, yeah, this. So when you open gremlin.com, you should be able to see a login button over here. Uh, when you click on login, it will ask you for registration. And uh, when you register onto your Gremlin application, so here you will see the dashboard, which, which shows you how do you set up Gremlin. So here we have uh, installed Gremlin on any any Linux or Windows environment. So depending on which environment you are using, you can install Grem Gremlin. So we have Ubuntu, Debian, we have CentOS. You can also use it for your Docker images. Uh, then comes Helm. This is the one we are using. What exactly is Helm? So Helm is a package manager for Kubernetes. And uh, you can use it for Helm also. This is what we're going to use. Then there's Rel, which is basically your Red Hat Enterprise 
uh, license and uh, your Windows systems as well. So this is the one that we are using. You will start by exporting this particular variable, which is Gremlin team ID, and you're going to use this team ID that Gremlin, Gremlin automatically populates for you. Then comes the second variable, which is called as Gremlin cluster ID. And how do you find out this variable? So all the all these steps that we have, uh, uh, they are already present inside that chaos guide that we're talking about. And in order to uh, see the uh, context, the Kubernetes context that is running inside your application. So we can just run this particular command, which is called as kubectl config current context. And we get in the output as a Docker desktop here. So that is the Kubernetes cluster that we are running. And here you would be entering kube. In my case, it is Docker desktop. So I'm going to enter that. And that is what I have already entered and uh, kept it for the demo purposes. But uh, yes, um, so you don't have to keep it, keep the name as change it. It, it has to come in the name of the Kubernetes cluster. Then uh, we add the Gremlin Helm chart. So in order to add the uh, Gremlin Helm chart, we use this particular command, as simple as that. So you can just uh, select any of the directories in your system and just run this command. Uh, obviously, for all of these, you would need a Helm installation. And then for the next command, we need a kubectl installation. So then we are creating a Kubernetes namespace for Gremlin. And we run this command, which is called as kubectl create namespace Gremlin. Um, and I can show that this namespace already exists for me. So I run this command, which is kubectl get ns. And you can see that Gremlin namespace is already present. So what is kubectl? Kubectl is a, a command line utility for Kubernetes. It is also called as Kubernetes control. Or um, uh, you, can call, you can also, some people also call it as kubectl. So uh, yeah, there are different, different uh, names by which people are calling this. And then we finally install Gremlin. So here you can see that we are passing in three parameters, which is a team ID. And that comes in from here, the Gremlin cluster ID, which we have already seen. Uh, so we run kubectl get current context, and that is where we get the context from. And then the third one is Gremlin team secret. So where does the team secret comes from? So you go to this, uh, this particular account settings, and here you would find team settings. And inside the configuration, you can find the secret key. So you can just reset, and uh, that is where the uh, key is going to come from, like this. So uh, yeah, that is about installing Gremlin. So quite simple, right? This is what we have already done. Uh, and let's, let's also look at the next uh, set of tabs that we have in uh, Gremlin. So the next tab that we have is scenarios. Now, what is a scenario? Scenario is a, uh, it's a, it's a combination of an attack. So basically a scenario is something where you can link in your multiple attacks together. And then here we have attacks, so which is just a single attack. Now, uh, one of the advantages of Gremlin is that it gives you some recommended scenarios by default. So you can just pick up any of the scenarios that you can see here and just specify your target and start running in your attack. Okay, so uh, that is yeah one of the most uh, good, most uh, most beneficial features of Gremlin, and so there are these recommended scenarios, and you can depending on the kind of technology that you want to target, you can select your technology. For example, I want to target databases, so I select databases here, and then I see database specific uh, scenarios over here. Likewise, you can also filter these recommended scenarios based on the type of attacks that uh, that you want to do. So there are different types of attacks, and we are going to talk about these attacks uh, as we proceed further. So let's say if I want to do a CPU attack, wherein I'm I'm going to increase the consumption of CPU onto my application. So you can select CPU from here, and then we can we can see all the kind of CPU attacks that we have. Status scenarios, which is basically a combination of attacks, you can link multiple attacks and target your system together. Whereas in in the attacks, you would be able to create only a single attack. Now uh, either you can run your attacks. Uh, at the moment you create them, or you can also schedule them. And the same goes for scenarios. So that was that is what schedules talk about. So you can schedule your attacks or scenarios to run at a later point in time. So maybe I want to schedule the, uh, schedule the attack in the morning, but I want the attacks to run in the night, and or maybe tomorrow. So then we can use this particular functionality. Then we have the Gremlin client. So as you can see, we talked about the cloud instances, AWS, Azure, Docker. So these are all the clients that we have. And then here we can see the reports as well. So there can be two different uh, types of reports, the company level reports. And a company can consist of multiple teams. So you can also see the team level reports. And you can select the, uh, the timeline for which you want to view, view these reports. By default, it is two weeks. Uh, and that is because it's, it's, it's it's, it is equal, equivalent to a sprint, right, in most of the cases. And the next one is docs. So if you want to read about Gremlin, uh, you can just go to this link and read, read the documents over here. 
The next one is API. So Gremlin provides APIs also that you can readily call in from your build pipelines if you if you want. Um, and uh, yes, yeah, so there are all of these APIs available, uh, which you can use. So uh, as we have seen that Gremlin is, is, is giving you a very, very good user friendly interface, which can be simply used to attack your systems. Uh, and it also gives you recommended scenarios. So that's where we have picked up Gremlin, Gremlin as one of the tools for demoing today. Uh, the next that we have is Kiosk Toolkit. So, yeah, Ashish to talk about it. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, so, uh, I mean, we have heard a lot of a lot of good things about Gremlin, that it has a very good dashboard, comes with recommended scenarios. So, all of that, uh, all of these things are not there in the Kiosk Toolkit. But one of the primary reasons that why Kiosk Toolkit is being used in the market as of now is that it's an open source tool. Uh, Apache license and uh, can be downloaded on your systems, can work on your local, can work inside Kubernetes. So all of these things uh, stand out, uh, helps Chaos Toolkit stand out in the uh, different tools that we have for doing Chaos Engineering. So that's one of the reasons why Chaos Toolkit is so popular in the market. Uh, another reason is uh, that, that it runs inside Kubernetes and outside Kubernetes as well. Uh, other thing is uh, that it provides the end-to-end -end, uh, chaos engineering platform. So what we can do is we can create uh, JSON YAML files, JSON or YAML files uh, that will be used by Chaos Toolkit to perform chaos experiments. But let's just see uh, at this image first. Uh, so we have a user uh, and we have a live system. So live system can be based on any infrastructure. In our case, it is based on Kubernetes. So uh, now the, this particular user wants to uh, perform chaos engineering on the Kubernetes system. So what they will do is, first, first of all, they need a chaos toolkit uh, tool. And then along with the chaos toolkit, we need some drivers. So drivers serves as a plugins. Uh, it helps chaos toolkit in providing the different uh, range of experiments which can be supported by chaos toolkit. So let's just go to the GitHub and see what all setup part we have done. Uh, so Swati, if you go to the GitHub, uh, fine. Yeah. Is this okay? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So uh, as part of prerequisite, uh, what we have done is we have set up a cluster running on our Docker desktop. So we have deployed this ThoughtWorkFlix app uh, application, and we have run this application in multiple namespaces, and it is running a little differently so that we can uh, show you some kind of attacks and the respective behavior. So that's a cluster has been set up. Then we have set up a virtual environment uh, for installing uh, Chaos Toolkit. So we have installed uh, Chaos Toolkit. Uh, the prerequisite for uh, having this Chaos Toolkit is we should have Python in our system and a pip. So Python install packager is required to install any Chaos Toolkit libraries or plugins that we want. And uh, we are doing inside a virtual environment, all of these libraries. Then uh, we have used Istio Service Mesh. Uh, so we have used this uh, for controlling the network management inside the Kubernetes cluster. So Istio is a sidecar proxy container which runs along with the application and manages your networking management. That how it is talking to other microservices inside the Kubernetes cluster. The, then as a part of setup, uh, we have installed Chaos Toolkit. Uh, we have done that using pep. And we have installed three plugins, uh, Kubernetes, uh, Chaos Toolkit Kubernetes plugin. So this will be required for our state attacks. Then uh, we have we are using Chaos Toolkit Istio plugin. So this will be used for our network attacks. And then uh, after that, we have done some monitoring setup. Uh, so we will be using one K9 utility. And we have also set up Kubernetes dashboard, which have metric server enabled as well. So Swati, I think we can show it once, uh, the Kubernetes dashboard. Yeah, just a moment. Yep. Yeah, so that is how a Kubernetes dashboard looks like. And uh, so all the namespaces that you have inside your Kubernetes, you can see the, all those namespaces over here. And let's say if I select one of these namespaces, which is ThoughtFlex microservice state, we are going to talk about this namespace in detail. Uh, so you can select this namespace and depending on uh, the, the kind of uh, the workload that you're looking at, for example, you can you can look at the pods, and here you can see the metrics, which is the CPU and memory. Yeah. So uh, we have monitoring setup uh, for our application. Um, the Kubernetes dashboard is the one. 
and then we are setting up application as per our attack so maybe we might be setting up differently when we are performing a state attack and we might be setting that application a little in a different way uh, using istio when we are performing a network attacks so this is uh, on a brief level that what all uh, prerequisite and setup we have done for chaos toolkit now coming back to a little more introduction on the tool uh, so chaos toolkit as i already told you that it uses the json yaml files uh, to perform uh, the chaos experiments uh, so what uh, on a high level uh, what this uh, yaml files include is uh, it has three mandatory components one is my steady state hypothesis another one is my experiment like what kind of attack i'm going to perform and another is the rollback so with these three things combined it perform it uh, provides us the end to end implementation of chaos engineering like where we can do a steady state check for our system then inject a attack and then do the rollback so that our system restores to what it was previously so that uh, platform is being provided by chaos toolkit it's a cli based tool we will be using cli commands to run uh, chaos attacks using chaos toolkit now uh, talking a little bit about chaos experiment steps uh, so we will be using these terms interchangeably when we are performing the demo uh, chaos experiment steps uh, so some of the terms important terms are steady state uh, so steady state is something that what is your uh, state of the system where it is performing uh, really well serving all the network request uh, there are no application instances down so what is the happy state of the system so that's what my steady state defines then the next one is the hypothesis so uh, before performing any new thing or any new attack or any new activity we do we just think about it you know if we going to do this what's going to happen and what will be our desired state of action and we plan our things so all of these things are done as a part of hypothesis so let's i'll take an example let's say we are doing a state attack and in our kubernetes system i'm going to drain a node or i'm going to kill some pod so i'm going to plan according to that okay uh, what if i'm killing a pod then i'm expecting my application should come back on its own and it should start serving request after a small delay of time i'm not expecting a much delay that it should not come on on and uh, i'm expecting it should come and start serving uh, functioning normally so that's what my hypothesis is and uh, in my hypothesis i also plan for like worst case scenario so what if you know the things doesn't work out properly what i'm going to do how i'm going to about what's going to be my rule back condition so all of these things comes under the chaos hypothesis like so this is the next activity when you define a steady state of your system you define an hypothesis then you design the experiment according to your hypothesis you have, you have drafted so in designing the experiment you plan a scenario like what all activities you going to do as a part of chaos experiment you going to put some steady check uh, steady checks you going to introduce in a uh, chaos attack in the system and then monitor uh, do the observability part all these things comes under the designing of experiment that we're going to see in uh, gremlin and chaos toolkit both uh, the next one is learning and results so this is for sure like after your experiment is ended and uh, uh, you are have uh, observed done all the observability and uh, have collected the metrics then you learn from these things you have identified the weaknesses in the system and then you plan accordingly that how can you make the application more fault tolerant so that whenever these kind of attacks happen in production we don't face such issues and then accordingly you plan for your application fixes if you have to fix something you can do that so these are some of the terms that we're going to use uh, interchangeably uh, in our uh, well performing the attacks yeah yes so now we are going to start with our first attack which is a state process killer attack and before we start with it let's let's get to know what these terms actually means so real world scenario so what is a real world scenario so you you perform an attack and what benefits do you get out of performing that attack right how is the attack valuable to you so there has to be some real world scenario and then then comes in hypothesis what so what is hypothesis hypothesis is, a, is an assumption that you make so before you before you start running your attack you you make some assumptions right so when you do this attack this this should be my expected output this is how my application should should respond when it is attacked this way that is what your hypothesis is then experiment is performing the actual attack and verifying that the assumptions that you made for the outputs are the same as what you are actually getting or not health checks and steady state like ashish already mentioned steady state is the happy state of the system and the application should be all up and running so whatever resources that we require in the application should be all up and running um, and yes so we we uh, we do a health check of, of the system that how what how was the application before the attack and then now how is it after we have performed the attack 
then comes a bot condition so it can be possible that your application goes down it stops responding right so that is where you know that you have to abort your attack from running so that is what an abort condition is and then once you once you abort your attack so you have to bring your bring your application back to the state to the happy state that we are talking about that means everything should be up and running so that is what rollback is now uh, now we now we are going to do this attack which is a state process killer attack so we have a, a kubernetes cluster available which is called as docker desktop and as we have already seen this how do we get this so we run this command which is called as kubectl config current context and here we can see the Uh, Kubernetes cluster, which is Docker Desktop. So we have a Kubernetes cluster. Then inside of the Kubernetes cluster, we have namespaces running, and we are talking about this namespace, which is Thoughtflex Microservice State. So we run this command, which is called as kubectl get ns, and we get a list of the namespaces that we have in Kubernetes, and we are talking about this particular namespace at the moment, which is Thoughtflex Microservice State. Now inside of this uh, this namespace, we have the kubernetes node and which which in turn consist of the pods so let's let's look at these pods so we are using the k9s utility which is again a command line utility for uh, kubernetes and it gives you uh, gives you it, it it shows the kubernetes resources in a better way as compared to kube kubectl so we run k9s hyphen n and here we specify the name of our namespace which is in our case we are talking about thoughtflex microservice state Oh, I think I may specify the wrong name. Just a moment. Yeah. So here inside this namespace, we have two pods running. One is the microservice pod, and other one is the DB pod. Now, what we are going to do is we are going to target this pod, which is the microservice pod, and we are going to terminate this pod. So how now? Now, as per this uh, this attack, so we're talking about the state attack. So let's also talk about how these terms maps. to these attacks so we're talking about real world scenario why would you want to terminate a pod from running why would why why would you want to uh, terminate a part of your application which is running so uh, as ravender talked about in the previous slides that we want a system to be highly available right so uh, if if a if a pod goes down we still would want the the system to be up and running or even if it goes down it should come up in a in a very uh, small amount of time so that is what we want to check that a system is highly available or not even if we terminate a pod how is it coming up after we perform the attack so the hypothesis is that once we terminate a pod uh, it should not take a lot of time for the pod to come up again come back again so it should be it, this this trans transition should happen within a very small amount of time the experiment is that we are going to run uh, a state attack in gremlin and uh, in chaos toolkit as well the health check of the system will be that the application pods both the pods so the one that we terminate and the other one as well should be up and running Uh, after the attack is completed the abort condition so if the application stops responding after a duration of let's say 60 seconds or maybe 120 seconds in that case we'll have to abort the attack and then we'll have to roll it back so we'll have to again restart the pod on our own so that is what uh, these terms means when we talk about state attack now let's do this attack so we are going to do this attack using gremlin first so we go to gremlin dashboard and we go to attacks from here we select a new attack so here you can see that we have one host there are 62 containers present inside and there are uh, these these kubernetes resources available so we have a cluster name which we have already seen that how do we get this cluster and then all the name spaces that are present inside this cluster we should be able to see here uh, so we select our uh, name space which is in our case thoughtflex microservice state and like we said that we are going to terminate the pod which is named as thoughtflex microservice so uh, either we can target all objects or we can select any one particular deployment so what what we are targeting is not the db but thoughtflex microservice pod so like i am saying that we can we can target all the objects all the resources as well but at the moment we are targeting only the thoughtflex microservice pod then you scroll down and uh, you should be able to see choose a gremlin from here that means choose a gremlin means choose the type of attack that you want to do so here we can see there are three types of attacks three categories of attacks and then uh, here uh, for each of the category we can see the sub attacks that are listed over here so we are talking about the state attack and here we have three types of attacks which is a process killer and as it says it is an attack which kills the specified process then we have a shutdown attack which uh, which reboots or shuts down the targeted host 
operating system and then we have a time travel which changes the system time and as you can see that process killer and time travel they are logged they are available in the paid or licensed version of gremlin whereas the shutdown attack is unlocked then we can use it the state attack that we talked about is the shutdown attack so we are going to terminate a pod and uh, it should it should uh, be started again it should be rebooted again so here we can specify the delay so do you want to uh, do the attack now or do you want to wait for some time so let's say if i don't want to wait for any time over here so i, I put in a zero that attack uh, attack my pod as soon as i start running this attack and then reboot do you want to so after the pod gets terminated do you want to reboot the pod on its own or not so if yes is your answer then you will choose on if no then you will keep it turned off and then unleash gremlin would start attack would start attacking the application so we click on unleash gremlin and at this moment uh, we should be able to see in some time this pod going down i'll just quickly refresh before that happens so as you can see that the thoughtplex microservice uh, pod that we targeted has gone down and you can see it, it is in red and also the ready state is 0 by 1 so now it has restarted and it is all in blue that means now the uh, pod has came up again so that means the system is highly available even if a pod gets terminated it should be able to come back in in a very small span of time so that is what a state attack is now we are going to see the same attack uh, using kiosk toolkit so over to ashish for doing that can you um, allow me to share uh, yes yeah thank you yeah uh, okay i think swati has already set up the context uh, so what was required uh, when we are performing a state attack from gremlin so i'm going to i'm going to do the same thing uh, i'm using the k9 utility again uh, to monitor the pods uh, so this i'm using a different namespace and i'll be showing you two attacks uh, on two different namespace uh, so it's the same application but has been set up in two different namespace a little different in a little different way so uh, the first one uh, i'm using the namespace thoughtflix microservices state 1 so here again we have two pods one is the db pod running and one is the uh, microservice pod running and uh, again we'll be using another namespace which has been set up a little differently so now uh, before i uh, tag the kiosk uh, this particular pod let's just see uh, what what kind of files are being used to perform the kiosk attack by kiosk toolkit so i'll just open one yaml file and let's just see what all these yaml contains so here uh, it starts from here uh, this is the command uh, so starts with the version title and description so this i'm not maintaining any versioning for this file uh, the title is what happens if we terminate a pod and the description is something which is built on my hypothesis that if a pod is terminated a new one should be created in its place and we have some optional tags along with this yaml file so uh, as i already mentioned in the introduction there are three components of a yaml file uh, the first one is steady state hypothesis so in steady state hypothesis we check the uh, happy state of the system so here i have entered three props uh, let's just see what kind of these props are so the first one is the pod exist here what we are doing is we are count we are using a function which is counting the number of pods and we have passed the label selector that it should count number of pods which has app thoughtplex microservice so here if you see on the k9 utility we have only one pod which is running with the name thoughtplex microservice and similarly we have put the value in the tolerance so in this particular prop we are expecting that one pod should be running which has a name thoughtplex microservice so that's one of the pod and this is coming from the module kiosk toolkit uh, kubernetes plugin so we have already installed this plugin as a part of setup uh, there are two more uh, steady state hypothesis props that has been defined uh, the second one is pod in phase so we are checking the phase condition of the particular pod and we are making sure that it should be uh, in a ready state uh, if you see here it's ready one by one and its condition should be running so here we have put a ready uh, with a state true and uh, it doesn't require a tolerance because we are just checking the ready should be true one by one and here we are checking the phase should be running and the tolerance should be true so we are expecting both the conditions that the pod should be in running state and should be uh, readily serving all the network request which are being hit to this particular pod so this is my first major component uh, 
of doing steady state hypothesis check. So uh, when the steady state hypothesis is run, uh, it runs before an action is injected into the system. So it runs before that and after the action has been completed. We'll see that when we uh, run, uh, run the chaos experiment. The second uh, mandatory component of the chaos uh, toolkit YAML files is the action. So what kind of attack or action you're going to perform. So in this particular uh, experiment, we're going to terminate a pod. Um, and uh, this is again coming from the same module and the function used here is terminate pods. So we are just terminating a pod. We are passing a command which just terminate this particular pod. And in the arguments, we are passing the label selector. Again, the app name ThoughtFlix microservice. We are passing a variable random, uh, though it will not be significant at this particular place uh, because here we are doing targeted experiments. But in case you want to do any random experiment, like for a particular namespace, you just want to do any random killing, then you can do, use this variable. And then we have mentioned a namespace, ThoughtFlix microservice state one. Apart from that, we have mentioned a pause. Uh, so we are pausing uh, after the action has injected for 15 seconds uh, because Kubernetes on its own takes some time to terminate a pod and the new pod coming up. So it takes some time. So we are having a pause of 15 seconds here. So that's a very basic uh, YAML file that we have created to check the state attack by a chaos toolkit. So uh, all these commands are again, I'm just, I'll be just doing copy paste from the chaos guide. Uh, so you can try it at your home as well. Now, so this was the first one I ran. I just opened the file. Now I'll run this particular uh, command. So let's just see the behavior on the K9 utility first, and then we will go and read uh, what the output is printing. So I have initiated the run. Uh, let's just monitor this ThoughtFlex microservice one. Now it turned the color change and the status change to terminating. And uh, the ready is also zero of one and uh, the restart count is still three though. So it has terminated, it has gone back and um, it hasn't come up. So now uh, let's see uh, why it didn't came up on its own and uh, probably we could find something in the uh, experiment logs here. So how it started when we uh, run the YAML file, uh, it just prompted me to upgrade my version for Chaos Toolkit. Then uh, as a first step, it validated the experiment syntax. If the syntax is not valid, it will uh, stop it here. So experiment looks valid. Then uh, it prints the title and uh, the description. So what happens if we terminate a pod that we put up in the YAML file? Then uh, it started with doing a steady state hypothesis check. So first uh, check was that pod exist. Yes, it existed uh, before we injected the attack. The pod phase was correct. The pod condition was correct. So on my initial level, the steady state hypothesis was met. Okay. Then my action was injected, uh, which is terminate pod. And uh, after the action was injected, we have mentioned a pause. So the activity got paused for 15 seconds. So if you see the time difference here is 15 seconds. Then after again, uh, it started doing the steady state hypothesis. So steady state hypothesis will be done after every method and before every method. So you can define n number of methods in the YAML file. And it will be done at every uh, alternate place where the method has been injected into your live system. So uh, when it started doing the steady state hypothesis after the method was injected, where we terminated the pod, then uh, the first probe failed uh, that because uh, the pod has terminated and it is not there anymore. So the count was zero at this particular stage. And uh, what we have given in the tolerance was one. So this particular steady state uh, check failed and the experiment ended with the devi deviation state. So here I, our experiment failed. If I just do an, uh, sorry. Uh, so uh, this was our first check uh, on an application which was set up in a way that the pod should not come up on its own. Now let's just see another uh, so similar experiment on a different uh, namespace application, though it's running also two pods, one DP and one ThoughtFlex microservice, but we'll check the same kind of behavior on that particular namespace. So what I'll do is, uh, so this is the other namespace, ThoughtFlex microservice state two, and I'm going to do is, I'm going to run it here. So this is already uh, two pods up, ThoughtFlex microservice and DB. And here, uh, 
I, I have a new YAML file which is uh, dedicated dedicated to this particular namespace. Uh, I'll show you the difference because we do not need to uh, review the uh, whole YAML file again. I'll just show you the difference uh, what we have. So the only difference we have is for the namespace. In the first YAML file, which was our port phase one, we were attacking the state one namespace. And in the second one, we are attacking this uh, namespace state two. So this time we're going to run this particular YAML file and see uh, the behavior on this particular namespace application. So what I'll do is I'll run this. So now also uh, monitor the K9 utility. Here, uh, the state of one of the pod changed to terminating, but very instantly there was a new pod getting created and it came into running state and uh, also it's starting up if you go and verify logs. So it is up now. So the one has been terminated and the other one uh, has been up and running. So in this particular namespace, we see that our deployments, uh, like the pod deployments were being managed by some deployment.yaml or any horizontal pod autoscaler. In this case, we came, uh, the pod came up on its own, but in our previous namespace, uh, we see the pod got terminated and it never came up. So this is, these are the things that can make your application app uh, fault tolerant, where you can uh, manage your deployments by deployment or YAML or mention uh, any horizontal pod autoscaler where it just auto scales on its own whenever it see any failure. So these are some methods which can make your application uh, fault tolerant whenever you are dealing with state attacks. Uh, so just to uh, briefly read down the logs for this, uh, the second YAML that we did. So again, the uh, upgrade uh, thing and then uh, experiment syntax. So steady state hypothesis passed this time because our pod existed. Then the action was injected, uh, pause happened. And after that, the steady state hypothesis happened as well. And uh, here it's prompting one more, let's roll back. We didn't declare any rollback. Uh, but we'll be covering that in the next attack. We will show you that how we can uh, roll back some of the attacks we have injected in the system. But this is how my experiment ended with a success state. And in the previous one, we ended with the deviated state. So that's the difference uh, where you can manage your deployments from uh, in a different way, which can help you in maintaining the healthy state of the application. Cool. Uh, so that was uh, on the state attack. Uh, We'll jump to network. Uh, so uh, network black hole and a what? In this case, uh, we have an answer application. We have a UI pod running as well. And we have a microservice. We have a DB pod. And in this particular namespace, we have enabled the Istio. Uh, so we are controlling all the network management uh, between these two pods and also between the microservice and the DB pod. So with every, U, like for ThoughtBlix UI pod, there will be a proxy container running. Which, are, which is managing the uh, network for UI and uh, similarly for the ThoughtBlix microservice. So again, it's running on the local Docker desktop. Uh, let's see what is the real world scenario and why do you want to do a network block or a bot attack? So uh, there could be a situation where you want to test that how your UI performs uh, whenever there is an API failure or a DB failure. So what kind of errors we are presenting to the customer and if there is any issue can we handle that by using some uh, cache implementation or by prompting the user, you know, if this particular module is down, you can uh, traverse through this particular module. So these are the things that we can evaluate whenever we are performing a network block hole or a bot attack. So hypothesis is built on the same thing that whenever there is any network issue in our system, we should make sure that uh, either we retry or uh, the app doesn't become unreachable for longer duration. We should explore different options that, uh, we can, uh, like, for example, if there is any uh, e-commerce website, if we have one, uh, like, say, shoes module is down, we can ask the customer to traverse through a clothing module or some other module. So this way we can uh, handle such kind of situations. So in this experiment, uh, we're going to perform a black hole attack where we're going to drop all the network uh, coming to this ThoughtFlix microservices pod via Gremlin. And uh, in Chaos Toolkit, we're going to emit 50% of the request being hit to this ThoughtFlix microservice. In this particular state, uh, the health checks is something that whenever a ThoughtFlix UI hits a request to ThoughtFlix microservice, it should respond with a success message. So if I just uh, show you here, what is my healthy state? So if I just run a for loop uh, and I'm running it for 10 times, 
Here I'm just doing a curl request, uh, which is getting initiated from Thoughtflix UI and reaching to Thoughtflix microservice. And this should return a, a 200 response. So it's saying that, hello, this is a Thoughtflix microservices responding with 200 status. So that's my happy state of the system where it's functioning all the 10 requests being hit to this uh, Thoughtflix microservice from Thoughtflix UI. And a bot condition is something if, uh, is something if uh, this it's not responding uh, for longer duration, then we have to abort uh, our experiment and do the rollback where we have to remove this uh, particular abort we have injected in the system or we have performed the black hole. So uh, this is what we're gonna see on the network. Uh, let's see it first from Gremlin and then we will see from Chaos Toolkit. I hope my screen is visible. So as, as Ashish mentioned that we have this another namespace, which is named as Thoughtflix microservice. Again, you get and get a list of these namespaces by running the command, which is qctl get ns. And uh, we get this namespace list. Now inside this namespace, we have, uh, there are there are two, uh, two UI pods running. There are two microservice pods running, and then there is one DB pod uh, service running. Now, uh, also here, as compared to the previous namespace, uh, if we remember that uh, in the case of the previous namespace, there were there were one one container each for that namespace. But here we have two containers. One of the containers is the application containers, and the other one is an Istio container. So, what is an Istio container? What what do we mean by Istio? So, Istio is a Istio is a service mesh. Okay, it is it is used uh, as a service registry. It it is used for providing a secure end to end. Uh, communication in between your application pods. And uh, here we have the application pod running. Uh, yeah, so there are these, these multiple pods that we have inside the application. And now what we are going to do is we are going to target the microservice pod. So all the requests goes in from the UI to microservice pod, which in turn calls the DB and returns the responses back to your UI. There's this curl request that we have, uh, just a moment. So there's this curl request that we have. And uh, when we run this curl, we are able to get a response, which is, hello, this is Thoughtflix microservice responding with a 200 status. And uh, now we're going to attack this system. And in that case, we should be able to see that uh, we won't be getting a 200 status in the response. Uh, so let's, let's run this using Gremlin at first. So we go to Gremlin again. And uh, the last time we saw attacks, right? So now let's see the scenario. So we discussed that scenario is a combination of attack, right? So what we can do is we can create a new scenario. We can give it a name. So let's say if I am giving it the name as Thoughtflix Network. Okay. Any name you can give. And uh, the rest of the things looks quite similar to as attack itself. So we have one host available. There are 62 containers. And then we have these, these many Kubernetes resources available. So the cluster is already selected. Uh, we only have one cluster running at the moment. We select the namespace and the namespace this time is Thoughtflex microservice. Let's confirm that. So this is Thoughtflex microservice. And we are going to target not all the objects, but we are only going to target the Thoughtflex microservice attack, uh, the, uh, the deployment, which is named as Thoughtflex microservice. And like we're saying that all the requests from the UI comes into the microservice and which and then uh, turn calls uh, DB and then returns back the response to the UI. So we are going to block all the network calls that are coming to Thoughtflix microservice. All right, uh, then uh, this time we will select the network attack and here we have different types of attacks again. So there's a black hole which drops all the matching network tra traffic. Then we have DNS which drops all the access to your DN DNS servers. We have latency which, which adds some delay in your network traffic and then there's packet loss wherein whatever information you are uh, communicating from one place to another, you you intercept some of those packets and delete them. So we select black hole and uh, we can specify the time, the duration for which we want the attack to run. So by default it is 60 seconds, that is one minute. And then you can also specify local ports and all of these information. By default, uh, we are keeping it blank and it is going to pick up uh, all the default configuration. And uh, we can now add all of this configuration to the scenario. And this is one attack that we have added and we can also add multiple attacks. So that is a scenario where you can add multiple attacks. So we save the scenario and after saving it, we run the scenario. Uh, yes, so now let's run the scenario. While the scenario is running, we would call in this uh, curl request in a loop. 
until now the application is responding okay let's let's just run it once again it is still responding so it hasn't started attacking the application yet so let's again see maybe let's just wait for something okay and at this moment you see that the application has stopped responding right so uh, that means that our traffic is getting blocked now and in some time so as we, as we can see that uh, now these pods are going down they should also be able to come back again come up again right so we should be able to see uh, in some time for now it is not responding with the 200 status uh, uh, code but uh, when these when these pods come up again we should be able to see that the application starts responding back again so it's going to a crash loop back and you can also see the errors that are coming in so you can just go inside this pod and uh, you can see that this is the pod that was that broke down and here you can see the details so you can see the logs as well like this going back let's see what is the state of the pods now so this one has come up and now this one has also come up so if we run this uh, curl request once again so now we are getting the re response which is a 200 status code so that is what is a network attack is wherein you block your networks network requests that are coming to your application and uh, then what is what is going to happen as the in the output uh, your, your your network calls will be blocked and here you would want to see that your application calls the resources comes up automatically again without you having to make uh, any modifications over there so that is how your you should be configuring your application so this is a, this was a network attack and that is how we we do a network attack in gremlin now we are going to see the same attack in chaos tools so over to ashish for doing that so uh, before that i mean let's just take a couple of minutes pause and uh, let's uh, get to know people like if someone has tried chaos engineering at their side and they have similar kinds of experience they want to share anyone now you can uh, just message or raise hand and we can uh, promote you to a panelist if someone wants to share their experience or any questions as well we anyone uh, just share your experience if you have tried or uh, experience any outages like this what okay uh, in that case uh, let's just see the same thing uh, from uh, your toolkit so uh, here i'm using the same namespace as swati did uh, uh, i'm also using this uh, k9 utility for uh, checking the namespace thoughtflix microservice so this is the same application which is uh, responding with 200 status in a happy state scenario now uh, let's uh, i'm i'll be co again copy pasting some commands from chaos guide uh, so uh, let's just see the yaml file uh, how it looks like uh, the network yaml that we're going to run uh, so this is the one um, it is coming from the different module our previous one was uh, from kubernetes this is coming from istio so here also we have same things uh, the first version then title what happens if we start aborting responses and if responses are aborted the dependent application should retry or time out uh, some request which is being getting timed out so this is what we are expecting from our system then we have some tags it's a kubernetes istio uh have you using a configuration uh, we are using a ingress host which is pointed to our local system then in this steady state uh, we have entered a prop uh, which is uh, doing a http request a curl request to the ingress host thoughtflix microservices coming from thoughtflix ui so as we have seen a success uh, response uh, saying that i am thoughtflix microservice so we are just uh, running the same request uh, with a time out of 5 seconds uh, for five number of times so here we have defined one probe 
and in the next four lines we are just putting reference to this uh, probe only so we are just running it for five times in our steady state hypothesis so uh, this is a probe we have defined in the method we have uh, included a method uh, which is aborting failure so here what we are doing is we are telling our module uh, kios istio to add abort fault on a particular virtual service which is thoughtflix microservice so this one we are injecting 50% fault that uh, 50% request coming to this uh, thoughtflix microservice pod should return 500 response so this is the attack we are injecting to the system here we have defined what response it should return 500 the routes we have defined that it should uh, go uh, and hit to thoughtflix microservice as a primary and uh, 50% uh, percent request should be failing and then uh, we have defined the namespace uh, thoughtflix microservice and here we are just using a pause of 1 second so this is our how our network yaml looks like here we haven't defined a rollback yet but uh, we'll be covering that in the next one so uh, let's just see and uh, first so we have a virtual service here So there are two two virtual services running, uh, Thoughtflix microservice and a UI. Uh, th so Thoughtflix microservices is defined as a primary service, and there is no fault injected into it right now because we haven't initiated this YAML file. Now let's just monitor this virtual service when we uh, run this particular YAML. So chaos run. now uh, let's just read uh, start reading this logs uh, again the upgrade then the experiment syntax steady state hypothesis so the app was healthy uh, before the attack was injected because we hit the request five times and uh, every time we received a 200 response then the steady state hypothesis was met uh, action was injected to abort the failure causing the activity uh, so again the steady state hypothesis uh, started so the first request uh, first request was successful second was failing and uh, the reason that it got failed is because uh, we have atta uh, attacked our service to return 500 whenever there is a, a request being hit to thoughtflix microservice so this value was not in the tolerance in tolerance we have defined 200 and this time we got 500 so the experimented uh, experiment ended with the status deviated now if i just go back to this k9 and i do a virtual service again and here if i just go and see this thoughtflix microservice Here, this time I see a new uh, a fault tag added to it, which is our HTTP status 500 should be returned for 50% of the request. So this is what this particular attack has done to this virtual service. Uh, so uh, this is how we can inject. Uh, I mean, it's not only uh, aborting the request; we can also add delays as well for any virtual service, and uh, we can also change the service endpoints. So these kind of things can be tried uh, via Kios Toolkit. now uh let's just see uh, how we can remove this because it's uh, if i go and run this now if i run the same for uh, loop uh, and i repeat this request 10 times this time i see uh, my first was successful second and third got failed then these three were successful so basically this fault has stayed in the system and it hasn't been removed so let's try to define a rollback where after the attack is injected the steady state hypothesis runs and if it runs we want this particular fault to be removed from the from the thoughtflix microservice which is a virtual service and uh, we want our application to perform normally after that so uh, let's just see another yaml uh, now this is uh, the second yaml that we're going to use network rollback so i'm just doing a diff of the first yaml file that we just ran and the second one we're going to do uh and the only difference is uh the we have added the rollbacks so in the rollback we have added an action uh, which is remove abort failure so in that one we were just adding that abort failure here we are doing the remove remove part for that and we have mentioned the virtual service from where it has to be removed and then again the versioning and the namespace remains the same so just another component which was the third component for the chaos toolkit yaml files it has been added now if i go and run this uh, before that i'll manually remove this uh, tag which has been in uh, the fault tag which has been added into the virtual service so just give me a minute
So my Thoughtflix microservices has been configured again. And if I just go and do a virtual service here, now my fault tag has been removed from this virtual service. So now let's run this where we will be uh, attacking the system again. We'll be adding the same fault and then we're going to roll back as well. So this is the command we're going to use. Uh, here I'm explicitly mentioning that uh, my rollback should run in case my experiment gets deviated from the system, from the help objects. So let's run this. So it started experiment validated, initial prop all passed. The action was injected. Then after the action was injected, the prop got paid because uh, the tolerance was not correct. And then uh, in this case, we are seeing a rollback happening as well. So let's roll back, roll back, remove about failure. Uh, and the action for removing that about failure has been triggered. Now, if I go back to here and I see my virtual service again for ThoughtFlix microservice, I don't see that fault tag anymore, here, which was there in our first run. So uh, we can define different rollbacks in case of state. We can uh, just start that particular pod manually if it's not coming on its own. So, and in case of network, we can uh, remove the abort failures or uh, any delays that we have added. So any action that you inject as a part of attack, it can be removed as well. We have functions available in our uh, plugins. So uh, that's how we can perform a network attack. But uh, so this case can come up, right? Because right now our ThoughtFlix microservices was failing and our front end was not able to, you know, function properly. So uh, what can be our redemption measure for this one? Uh, what I can do is I'll just quickly apply this file and I'll show you what exactly it is doing. So I've just changed a little configuration on my UI. Uh, now what I have till my UI is. So uh, here I have added a retry tag that you should try 10 number of times with a timeout of three seconds and you should retry on this particular condition. So going to back to this, my ThoughtFlix UI will hit the ThoughtFlix microservice first time. Let's say it got failed. Now my, I have uh, instructed my ThoughtFlix UI to retry 10 number of times with a timeout of three seconds until and unless you are receiving a 500 response. So as soon as you receive a 200, it is fine. But whenever you receive a 200, uh, sorry, 500 response, you should retry. So this kind of, uh, I've configured my ThoughtFlix UI microservice in such a way. Now, if I go and run the same attack, because initially my props was failing. Now, if I just go and run back the same uh, attack and see how my prop happens now. Sorry, just a sec. So again, uh, initial prop all passed, action was injected, uh, then paused. Then also my probs, uh, which was, uh, we suppose after the action has been injected, they also got passed because my, I've configured my ThoughtFlix UI to retry in case of failure. So this is how you can make your application more uh, fault tolerant in case of network attacks. You can configure your network configuration in such a way that it should smartly retry in case of any failed request happening intermittently. And it has rolled back as well. Yeah, so this is how you can perform network attacks via Chaos Toolkit. You can perform network delays or any service endpoint changes as well. Yep, over to you Swati for the final one. Thank you Ashish. Okay. Now the next attack is something that we all can relate to. So which is basically a CPU attack. Now, have you ever uh, have you ever seen that while you're working on your applications, maybe web or mobile? I've seen it majorly on mobile applications. If I if I take the names of these applications, so if, if you, you people are using or were using uh, before this pandemic happened, if you were using Shuttle to communicate to your offices, you might have seen that while using the application, uh, sometimes it used to hang a lot, right? Or sometimes the device used to get heated. Have you have you seen that? Or I'm talking about shuttle. You might have also seen this in some of the shopping applications. There can be such cases wherein the application hangs while you're loading. There can be cases wherein uh, you can see that the device is getting heated up. There can be certain cases where you can see the battery level of your uh, device reduces uh, fastly if you, uh, if you use such applications. Ever seen that? Ever noticed that? Anyone? 
all right so why does that happens that happens because your resources are are getting consumed at a high load okay so one of one of these uh, these resource attacks is a cpu attack so we are going to target our application that we have just seen uh, we have the same application which was which we used for the network attack so there is this microservice hotlex microservice application which is having again two ui pods uh, two uh, microservice pods and one db pods and now we are going to increase the cpu consumption of this application so why do we do that so the real world scenario would be to increase the cpu consumption and see if your application is responding the way it should so it, it should not the device should not get heated the battery consumption should, should still be the normal level it should not go beyond that and you should still be able to work on the application it should not stop responding basically right so that is what your hypothesis is also when you do the attack your application should be still running perfectly fine and the experiment is that we are going to do a cpu uh, attack we are going to increase the cpu consumption and uh, the health check would be that the cpu consumption might go up so we can we, we will see that happening but it should also come back to a steady state after some time so it should not remain uh, high always so uh, after we perform the attack uh, and the duration of the attack has ended the cpu consumption should come back to normal the abort condition will be if your application is not coming back to a normal state in that case you would abort your attack and the rollback strategy will be in a, if if it is required to restart your resources or increase your cpu consumption or let's say if you are targeting a uh, network or input output or disk space then increase those resources now let us see this attack using gremlin first so we are going to go to get gremlin we are going to go to attacks and in here we select a new attack again we have the host the containers and the kubernetes resources we select the cluster and we select the namespace the same one that we selected last time which is hotflix microservice and we can specify what do we want to target so uh, let's say we want to target the microservice pod itself so we select that and uh, then we go to choose a gremlin gremlin and this time we are not going to select a state or a network attack but a resource attack and here we can see that there are four types of attacks for resources so we have cpu which increases the cpu consumption on the resources disk which consumes the disk space io which consumes the input and output resources and memory which consumes memory and uh, we we have a kubernetes dashboard wherein we can see the current cpu and memory consumption of this particular namespace so we have the namespace selected from the list of namespaces and we can select pods from here and then we can see the current cpu and the memory consumption also in k9s we can see these matrices so we have as you can see it's 10 11 10 35 10, 10 and 9 right so just just keep a note of these numbers so it's not, not nothing is nothing is going beyond 35 just a moment so 34 now right now let's start attacking this so we select cpu from here and you can specify the time for which do you want to run this attack so you can run this attack for maybe 1 minute or 2 minutes so i'm running it for 1 minute uh you can specify the cpu ca capacity so you want to increase your cpu consumption up to a maximum of 50% or 60% let's say if i am doing it for 100% itself and then you can specify the number of cpu cores that you have running on your system so mine is a three core uh, system so i i select a three from here and then unleashing gremlin will start attacking the system so we click on unleash gremlin so attack is running and here we should be able to see in some time the cpu consumption going up so let me just refresh this quickly yeah so i was talking about those scenarios right did we get some answers on that whether has has somebody noticed that happening or not okay so now you can see uh, that the application is not able to uh, sustain that much amount of cpu consumption that came in so it uh, it terminated the pods 
and they have started running again so and uh, yeah so that basically that is what is a resource attack is so and you can see the pods getting down and the application is configured in such way such a way that uh, there will be the pods will come up on its own the application is built to scale up you can see that we are getting a critical cpu level and the the count was 10 11 34 was the maximum and you can see the count is now 19111946 so that is to an extent that we have increased the cpu consumption but the application is able to scale it has increased the number of microservice pods that were there there were only two and uh, we we can see that there are three more three more that are created by the application all configured automatically right so that is what a cpu attack is and we can also see it from the kubernetes dashboard and we can see that there were two microservice pods and now they have increased in order to handle the the requests that are coming on to the application so that is what a cpu attack is and since this was the last attack in gremlin let's also see the reports so we go to reports and like we already talked about that there are two different types of reports that we can see the company level reports and the team level reports a company can consist of multiple teams and we can select a time range from here so let's say if i select a month and here these are the kind of reports that we can see so there are these attacks and the screen indicates that all your attacks were successful the attack type so we have three types of attacks here which was cpu black hole and uh, network uh, the shutdown attack which is a state shutdown attack and uh, th those are the three types of attacks that we can actually do using gremlin the others are logged and yes there are some more reports that you can see also gremlin has plugins that you can integrate with and there are some monitoring dashboards also uh, so you can integrate them gremlin with with those kind of plugins and see better reports yeah so that was about the cpu attack uh, any any questions about this all right if not then let's let's see the same attack using chaos toolkit yeah. uh okay uh, so uh, chaos toolkit uh, there is no such plugins uh, in chaos toolkit which helps in uh, uh, creating resource attacks like cpu consumption or memory consumption but what chaos toolkit and gremlin team have done is they are uh, they have created a plugin which provides the integration between chaos toolkit and gremlin so we can initiate all our uh, resource attacks via chaos toolkit using this chaos toolkit gremlin plugin so uh, i'll show you the uh, yaml file first so this is again the title and description uh, can our system handle a node being cpu busy and uh, what kind of experience you want to behave whenever we you use a high consumption of cpu so in this case uh, one additional thing you will see is uh, as swati explained in the gremlin setup we need a gremlin email and password and then org name uh, to log into gremlin and do the uh, attacks via gremlin so we're going to pass the same thing uh, in the yaml file of uh, chaos toolkit so it can be related to any secrets if we are going to do integration with any other tool uh, you have to pass your secrets over here so we are passing uh, gremlin email password and org name i have exported it to my local and uh, those will be injected in here and then uh, we have added a method which is attack on cpu which is going to run in background so it's an action attack on cpu going to run in background and it's going to attack host uh, so we are not attacking any particular port but we are just attacking the whole docker desktop this time and we have passed the parameters of uh, type cpu and length 60 seconds and here also we are passing the secrets so we are going to use the same secrets of gremlin and then run an attack so i'll just run this uh, just this Uh, so again, uh, the experiment syntax got validated, and uh, the action was injected in background. This time, we're gonna not see any logs in here. But if I go back to Gremlin now, here in this, uh, there was an attack injected, uh, which is an active attack right now. So CPU attack has been uh, is getting displayed under the active. And if I go and click, it shows me the configuration which I entered into the YAML file that it's a CPU host attack requested by this particular user. and it has started at this particular place 
so uh, again it's same uh, in a same manner as swati shown via gremlin but just for doing resources attack uh, we can uh, utilize this chaos toolkit gremlin integration so that's the only information uh, available uh, for resource attack to be done via chaos toolkit now uh, so with this uh, okay one uh, more thing that i want to show so how does the reporting look like in uh, chaos toolkit i have a sample report here just a second yeah so uh, i'll show you the report first that how you can create customized reports uh, it can be a html report or a pdf report and uh, you can inject as many experiments as you want into that particular uh, file so it starts with here that's a pdf report chaos engineering report it's an old report uh, that was done last month and it has a list of experiments whatever you, you want to inject into this so this is coming from what happens if you have bot and delay responses so it has a summary definition results and there are more attacks to it uh, so in inside the summary you see all the details like for experiment what happens if you have bot uh, and delay responses you see a summary then you see the steady state hypothesis that what was the your uh, steady state system before the run then uh, you see the request for after the run and then what kind of method was injected and what the final result you got so you can generate uh, similar kinds of uh, report via chaos toolkit how it is being generated is uh, you have to create a journal json first uh, i'll show you the commands it's there in the chaos guide sorry it's here yeah so whenever we were running the experiments uh, if we start running them with the journal path and we are using a docker daemon here which is accepting this uh, so it's a chaos toolkit reporting plugin again uh, which is accepting uh, my this particular json and uh, i'm uh, performing an output i want to save my report into the pdf format so when you run this particular docker uh, command and uh, it will generate your pdf report which we have just seen now so passing journal uh, creating a journal via chaos run and then passing that particular journal to generate the pdf report uh, can be of help uh, to generate customized reports there are more plugins available as well you can also generate this in html format so there are different options available which we have put it in this guide and it can be explored now with this uh, we come to the end uh, for the demos we have seen one attack uh, state network and resource both from gremlin and chaos toolkit which should set up the base uh, that how we can perform different attacks so uh, a quick uh, recap of what was done in gremlin yeah so we started with installing and setting up gremlin we talked about doing a shutdown attack uh, we also did a network attack and we saw that all our requests were blocked for for some time till the pods started coming back again and then we did a cpu consumption increase uh, attack and we also saw reports in gremlin yeah and on the chaos toolkit side uh, we see uh, the prerequisite uh, what was uh, required as a part of prerequisite and now what all setup we did then we did a terminate pod attack on a similar kind of applications which was available on two different namespaces after that we did a network abort attack then uh, we also talked about rollback strategy where we removed this uh, network attack from the virtual service then we also see the reports chaos reports how it looks like we can generate pdf html reports and we also initiated a resource attack from chaos toolkit which was again with integration of chaos toolkit and gremlin so it was a recap uh, the last thing uh, from our side is so uh, though it's not a comparison exactly it's just an evaluation on some of the metrics that we generally take care of whenever we select a tool uh, so we have evaluated gremlin and chaos toolkit on some metrics industry standards uh, so installation and management so this was quite uh, good in gremlin we had a dashboard which is a great feature of uh, gremlin and it helps the user to do attacks by just selecting the targets whereas in chaos toolkit it's a command line utility can be a little uh, clumsy to use on the experiment definition and variations uh, here chaos toolkit stands out uh, way better than gremlin and uh, it has a very wide community support and there are many uh, plugins being discovered daily uh, on a daily basis and being enhanced 
So chaos toolkit is much better when it comes to experiment deviation and uh, the different variations we want to test. Cost, uh, chaos toolkit is an open source, uh, Apache license tool and uh, no cost in here. And uh, the Gremlin free version is there, but it has some own limitations and the pricing as far as uh, I've connected with them, it's $1,200 per host per year. Then we have uh, security and automatable. It has, both the tools are embedded with your, can be embedded with your CSAD pipelines. And there are no such known vulnerabilities as of now. So observability and report, uh, Kiosk Toolkit provided a more detailed report as we see, whereas uh, in Gremlin it was not that easy. And uh, when you want to integrate any open source observability plugins with Gremlin, there's a challenge there as well. So that's why Kiosk Toolkit provides any observability uh, with open source plugins as well. So uh, this is more of the evaluation from our side. Uh, yep. And at this point, I again want to call it out that we are not inclining towards any particular tool. There are several tools available in the market, uh, but, but we found these two tools uh, good for demonstrating. So there was a UI version available, which was Gremlin, and there was a CLI version available, which was Kiosk Toolkit. Uh, so yeah, that was the motive 